great to be here. It's great to be back in Columbus and great to be back at, at YMC. And uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to all of you on, on your successful uh, research projects and, and for being chosen to, to be here and, and to present me. Uh, it's, it's really a, a great gathering and it's wonderful for, for those of us who um, are old and stodgy and surround ourselves with old and stodgy people through the year. It's, it's wonderful to, to feel your, your energy and enthusiasm and the new ideas and new vision that, that you are bringing to mathematics and to your research. And, and that's what, what keeps this subject alive and, and vibrant. And so now I want to, to try to talk, uh, talk math. And so I'm giving a talk I've never given before about an object that, that I am, I'm just falling in love with now. And, uh, and I hope that you will find it as, as interesting and fascinating uh, as I do. I, I really think this object is going to be quite central in, in mathematics in the next you know, 10, 20, 50 years. Uh, and, and there are reasons why that, uh, uh, but, but let's, just, uh, let's just start with, with the object itself. So, so the object is called the graph complex. And, and it comes in, you know, like ice cream, it comes in different flavors. And I'm, I'm just going to give you one, one flavor. Uh, but, uh, so what are the graphs? So people mean many different things by graph, but we're going to talk about finite connected graphs. So this, they're very elementary and, and combinatorial. So they have some vertices and they have some edges. So, so let's give an example. So we have have some vertices and we could put in some edges between them and and this graph uh, has has a name and, and a label people call it k4 it's the complete graph on four vertices so there's four vertices one two three four and complete means that between every pair of vertices there's there's one edge and there's an operation that we're going to do on, on these graphs. And the one operation that we're going to focus on is the operation called edge contraction. And it does what, what it sounds like. It, it takes an edge and, and contracts it so the two vertices become one vertex and the edge goes away. So we could, we could do that to the complete graph. And we would get something that looks like this. So if this were our edge E, then this graph would be K4 mod E. So K4 with the edge E uh, contracted. And so, so uh, people do mean different things by, by graph. So note that we're allowing multiple edges. So we allow two vertices to be connected by, by two different edges. And we'll also allow allow loops. So an, a vertex could be connected to itself by and there's there's various numbers that one could keep track of to um, to encode how complicated a graph is. So there's the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the one that, that we'll keep track of the most. Well, we'll keep track of edges, and then we'll keep track of vertices by keeping track of something called uh, the genus. And so. G is the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus one. Okay, so there's, there's a definition of the genus. Intuitively, the genus is, is the number of loops. So, uh, so here in, in K4, there's one, two, three loops. And you could argue, well, but there's also like a fourth loop that goes around the outside. So let's be, let's be careful about what we mean by, by counting the number, number of loops. Uh, and, but before we're, we're careful, maybe we'll do, do a couple of examples. So, so here is a graph of, of genus one, so one vertex and, and one edge. There's the barbell, this has genus two. Okay. And we have uh, our K4 and the genus is And so there's, there's a word that floats around in, in mathematical circles a lot, homology, uh, cohomology. So genus is 
uh, an example of, of homology. So the genus is H1 of the graph, so the first Betty number. Uh, and so this is the dimension of the rational vector space big H1. And so don't be, so homology, cohomology, these are, are words that tend to be intimidating at first, and, and don't, don't let them be. So, so let me, um, let me demystify this, this H1. So we're going to look at a, a linear map between two vector spaces. So what are these vector spaces? Uh, so first, so we have, okay, so E of G is the set of edges, and D of G is the set of vertices. And roughly one thinks of the boundary of an edge is being two vertices, and you could take the difference of them. But if I think of the boundary of this edge as being the difference between these two vertices, do I mean this one minus this one, or this one minus this one? And so if I just look at the edge itself, then, then I can't decide. There's no way of, of keeping track. You'd only be off by a sign, but, but eventually those signs would, would cause us a lot of trouble. So instead, we look at a, at a bigger set. So this E twiddle of G, so this is the set of pairs E omega, where E is an edge, and omega is an orientation on E. So, uh, so if this were our edge E, then we could put one orientation on it. So let's say this is B omega, then this would be B minus omega. So the orientation in, in the other direction. Okay, so now we have a vector space, which we want to think of as a vector space spanned by the edges. Uh, but what we really do is we take the vector space whose basis is E twiddle. So we take the vector space generated freely by oriented edges, but then we mod out by the relation that uh, E minus omega is minus E omega. So if we chose one orientation that we preferred for each edge, then that would give us an isomorphism to the vector space with basis given by edges. But we want to work with, with this to avoid making that choice. Because if we made that choice, we would then have to keep track of that choice forever. So this is, this is the object we work with. Okay, and then we have C0 which is a little easier, so this is two to the vertices. And the reason why this is easier is because there's no, there aren't two different orientations on, on a vertex. So now what we want to do is define a boundary map, so D, that takes C1 to C0. And the way we do that is that D of this oriented edge, so I could draw E omega as an oriented edge from one vertex to another. It might be that D1 is equal to D0 if this was a loop edge. So D of that oriented edge is D1 minus D0. And now when we define it that way, we had better be, be careful because this is one of the generators for C1. But we have to check that this respects the relations on C1. And so if we took the opposite orientation, then we would get 
v0 minus v1, which is minus v1 minus v0. And so d is actually well defined on, on c1. Okay, so we checked our sign. So now we can define uh, so that h1 of g is the, the kernel of this map d. And so let's draw some, some elements for when g is equal to k4. So we could draw three oriented edges that form an oriented loop. And then you can check for yourself that, that d of this is 0, because we get plus this for this edge, and then minus this for this edge, and so forth, all the way around. And here we have another element of the kernel. And here we have another element of the kernel. Okay. And now what would happen if we added these up? The third one, the third edge. Is... Thank you. Ah, good. Okay, so now we have three elements of the kernel. <laughs> and if we were to add them up, on the interior edges, each interior edge shows up twice with opposite orientations each time. And so because of the relations on C1, those add up to zero. And we will get. Another, another loop, but so that fourth loop now we can say really is the sum of those three loops because we kept track of all of our orientations and signs here. Okay, so that's your, your introduction to, to homology if you haven't seen it before. And, and you know, from now on, K4 can be your, your Patronus whenever the uh, cohomological dementors come. Same <laughs> scary things. Okay. So what else should we do with graphs? So we compute their homology, we take edge contractions, and then we need a notion of when two graphs are essentially the same. So we need a notion of graph isomorphism. And I'm going to write down what I think a graph isomorphism is, and you could write down what you think a graph isomorphism is. And whatever we would write down, it would be uh, isomorphic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have two graphs, G and G prime. And so, so what's an isomorphism going to be? So it's going to be a map that takes vertices of G to vertices of G prime. And it should take edges of G to edges of G prime. And if it's going to be an isomorphism, then these should be bijections. So, And they should respect the relations, right? So sometimes vertices are contained in edges and sometimes they're not. So we should say that uh, a vertex B is contained in an edge if and only if the image of that vertex is contained in the image of that edge. So then these make the two graphs uh, match up. And there's a really interesting kind of isomorphism, which is the automorphisms. So these are isomorphisms from a graph to itself. And so these form a group. So you can compose an automorphism of a, of a graph, and the, the composition will be uh, associative, and automorphisms have inverses. So this is, this is a group. And this group acts on the set of vertices, and it acts on the set of edges. And we really want to actually pay attention to the action on the set of edges. And why the action on the set of edges? So if you think about it, uh, the automorphism group injects into the permutation group on the set of edges. So if you know how an automorphism acts on the edges, then you will also be able to figure out how it acts on the vertices. So let's do an example, and we'll, we'll stay with our our happy example of K4. So the automorphisms of K4. So I could take the four vertices and I could permute them in any which way. 
And there's exactly one automorphism of the graph for each permutation of the vertices. So the automorphism group of K4 is in that way uh, isomorphic to S4, so the symmetric group on, on the vertices. But now we want to think of that symmetric group on the vertices as sitting inside the symmetric group on the edges. So, so how does so how does that S4 sit inside S6? Okay. So if we take two vertices, if we take a transposition, so S4 is generated by transposition, if we switch two vertices in, in K4, then we end up doing a double transposition on the edges. So there's two pairs of edges that get interchanged. So, so S4 to S6, a transposition, maps to a double transposition. So in particular, S4 is sitting inside the alternating group on six elements, which is sitting inside the symmetric group. So all of these are even permutations on the edges, even though they are odd permutations on the vertices. And this will be important when we keep track of signs. Odd and even. Good. So there are lots of things that we could do to graphs that, that I, I don't want to do. So I don't want things to get too complicated. So we could take K4 and make it more and more complicated by adding in uh, lots of vertices, so uh, of valence 2. And we could also change K4 without changing the number of loops that it has, without changing the genus, by adding on a bunch of trees. And when you add on a bunch of trees, that at the end of the trees there will be leaves, so those are vertices of balance one. So I want to outlaw both of them. So we'll make a definition. And the definition is a stable graph. So the word comes from, from algebraic geometry. Uh, so these are the dual graphs of stable curves. But we'll just take this as a definition. So a graph is stable if all vertices have valence at least three. And valence is the number of edges at each vertex, but where loops count twice. So, so if you zoomed in at this vertex, you would see three pieces of edge coming out. So even though two of them come from the same edge, so it's really counting the number of half edges that touch each vertex. So those are the, the stable graphs. And so, so what's good about this definition? So uh, there are only finitely many isomorphism classes of stable graphs of genus B. Okay, so this wouldn't be true if, if we allowed the unstable graphs. We could, we could take any edge and subdivide it as many times as, as we want. And this is because, so having the valence be at least three, that means that so each vertex, uh, each, well, each half edge um, is the same that the number of edges is at least three halves times the number of vertices. And so this will mean that, uh, so the number of edges has to be at least G in order to have G loops. Uh, but the stability will mean that the number of edges is at most 3G minus 3. And then the number of vertices is determined by the number of edges, and since we know how many of each there are, there's only finitely many uh, possibilities. Okay, so then we have a nice finite set. So we'll say graphs GI. So this is the set of uh, graphs with genus G and I edges.
So yeah, that that's that finite or infinite. Hmm, a bunch of agnostics. <laughs> Ah, good, okay, so I hear both. <laughs> and you're both right. It's infinite, but there's finitely many up to isomorphism. <laughs> right, so this graph isn't the same as this graph, because this is not the vertex of this graph. Right, but those two graphs are isomorphic. Right, so this is a very infinite set. And probably if we were being careful, we should fix the mathematical universe. In which, Okay, okay so, it's, so it's an infinite set, but it's essentially finite. And so we're going to cut it down to finite size by, by imposing relations from isomorphisms. So, uh, so how are we going to do that? So just like Q to the edges was the wrong thing to consider when we computed the H1 of a graph, Q to the graph's GI would be the wrong thing to consider when we build the graph complex. So we need to decorate these graphs with something that will behave like an orientation. And so that's what we're going to do next. So we'll build graphs twiddle. So this is the set of pairs, G comma omega. So G is a graph. G is G with I edges, and omega will be a total ordering of the edges. Okay, so the edges of the graph here are behaving like the vertices of the edge here. Right, so an orientation on the edge, that was a total ordering of the vertices of that edge. So here we're taking a total ordering of the edges of the graph. And that's our orientation. And so now we're going to build a, a vector space. So this is KIG. So we're going to give generators, which are uh, graphs twiddle. And then we want to mod it out by relations. And so what are the relations? So G omega is equal to some sign, so plus or minus uh, g prime omega prime. Uh, and we'll do that whenever there's an isomorphism. Now, if we have an isomorphism of the graphs, that will induce a permutation of the edge ordinates. So, so, we'll, so g omega is equal to the sine of sigma times g prime omega prime whenever there's an isomorphism phi from g to g prime that induces the permutation sigma on the edge order. So the idea here is that so our edges are labeled from 1 to i. Um, so this would be omega inverse. So this is 2 e of g. And then we have phi mapping to e of g prime. And then we have omega prime takes us back to uh, 1 through i. So this composition is a permutation uh, of the i element set. And so we'll call that permutation sigma. So if we do an even permutation on the edges, then the two oriented graphs are equal. And if we do an odd permutation on the edge labels, then the two oriented graphs differ by a sign. And since there are only finitely many isomorphism classes of graphs, this is a finite dimensional vector space. And alpha is the number of isomorphism classes uh, G in graphs GI. Uh, such that the automorphism group of the graph sits inside the alternating permutations on the edges. 
So if a graph has an automorphism that acts by an odd permutation on the edges, then the class of that graph is identified with minus itself. And so then we, so that, that dies here. What about K4? So does K4 live in K36? If we chose an orientation on the edges? Yeah, okay, good. So all the, all the unmorphisms of, of K4 act by alternating permutations on the edge side. Now we want to, to look at the, the differential, the, the D, just like we had for computing each one of the graphs. So we have Di is going to be a linear map from Kig to K i minus 1g. And it's going to be built out of edge contractions. So if I have a graph and I have a total ordering of its edges, and I contract one of those edges, then I get a total ordering of the edges on the resulting graph just by ignoring the edge that's now gone. Okay, so the remaining edges are, keep the same ordering. So, so G omega maps to the sum over all J of G mod EJ. So contract the J edge, uh, and I want to multiply that by minus 1 to the J, and omega J hat. So, just meaning take the ordering on the edges, but forget the j to edge. <laughs> so an important proposition. So this is something that, that will that will appear every time that you, you encounter one of the incarnations of, of homology. And the proposition is that if I take di minus 1 of di, then that composition will be 0. OK, so, so why is that? Well, I can apply it to, to check that a map is 0. I just have to check it on one of the generators. So di minus 1 of di of g omega. So this is a sum. So I'm going to contract two edges, j and k. And so I could, uh, if I have a pair of edges, j and k, I can order them. So either j is less than k or k is less than j. So let's just choose them so that j is less than k. So I'll take the sum over j less than k. And if I first contract the kth edge, and then contract the jth edge, then I will get minus 1 to the k times minus 1 to the j times g mod. So I'm going to contract both of those edges. And I'll take the ordering that I get by ignoring both j and k. I will also get the same graph by contracting first the jth edge and then the kth edge. So I'll do plus minus 1 to the j. But after I've contracted the jth edge, what used to be the kth edge is now the k minus first edge. So I have minus 1 to the j times minus 1 to the k minus 1. And then I have the same graph, g mod e j e k, with the same ordering, omega j k. But uh, this one has one more minus one than this one. So this is easy. So if you haven't seen this before, you're getting to 
and continue on to grad school, you will see this many, 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 many times. Oh, and it's sort of the, the basis for uh, all, all combinatorial homology theories. So since di minus one of di is zero, the image of di is contained in the kernel of di minus one. And so we will say that uh, hi of kg is the uh, kernel of di. So now it should be modular the image of di plus one. So this is some vector space. It is uh, generated by classes of uh, well, linear combinations of oriented graphs uh, that vanish under E, modulo those that come from edge contraction from something with, with one more edge. So let's do an example. So let's apply D to K4. So if I take my K4 and I contract any edge, they all are isomorphic to each other. So I'm going to get some constant. So D of this is equal to some constant times this, okay, with some orientations on both. But this has a pair of edges between these two vertices. So this has multiple edges. So if I were to transpose these two edges, would that be an automorphism? Yeah. Even or odd? Odd. Right. So, so this graph is zero in the graph complex. So whenever you have a graph that has multiple edges, it's, it's zero. So that means that this is in the kernel of D6 for G equals 3. Now, could it be in the image of D7? Okay, so I see someone saying no, so why no? Um, you have another, so if it's an image, you have to be, you have to get it from tracking an edge. Yes. A fiber graph, and yes. then that head would have a vertex of degree one. It would have a vertex of degree one or two. Yeah, good. So there are no stable graphs of genus 3 with more than six edges. So, so D is mapping from 0 to K36. So, so this is a so this is non-zero in uh, H6 of the graph complex in genus 3. This is, in fact, all of, this is the only non-zero class in the homology of the graph complex for genus 3. Let's do another, let's do another example. So once you have one example of a non-trivial graph homology class, you'll, you'll try to generalize it. And so we could take, instead of the complete graph on four vertices, we could take the complete graph on n vertices, where and is, say, bigger. So the, all of these graphs have the following property. Every edge is contained in a triangle. So if you have an edge that's contained in a triangle and you contract it, then you get a pair of edges between the same two vertices. So whenever you have a graph such that every edge is contained in a triangle and you apply D, you get zero. So 
KN, so KN is in the kernel of uh, D. And this is, uh, these graphs have N choose two edges, and the genus is N minus N choose two. So now the question is, are they, are they in the image of D? So if we take K5, so could there be a graph with 11 edges such that when we apply D and contract and take that linear combination, could we get something like K5? I don't know an easy way of answering that question. But so now, so now we start to get to sort of real, real mathematics. So, so here's a, a theorem. So a theorem is if h i of the graph complex is zero for i less than two g. So k four that had six edges, g was equal to three. So that is the smallest possible number of edges that you could have by this theorem in order to get non-trivial homology in the graph complex. So now if you look at K5, so that has 10 edges, and it has genus 6. 10 minus 5 plus 1 is 6. 10 is less than 2 times 6. And so it cannot be a non-trivial homology class, so it is in the image of D. So can you write down those graphs? I don't know what they are. Okay. So, so that's, that's a, a problem. What about, for, what about for K6? What about for K7? So all of them have the property that the number of edges is less than 2 times the genus. And so all of them are in the image of D. So there's some elementary graph theory problem that needs to be solved to show why that's true. So I'll, I'll tell you what goes into the proof that I know of this theorem. So it uses uh, topology, or uh, geometric proof theory, uh, in the form of the virtual cohomological dimension of the mapping class group of a compact orientable surface of genus G uh, plus algebraic geometry in the form of um, the mixed hot structure on the cohomology of energy. So put those two ingredients together and you, you get this. I find, I find this for me, this is provocative. This is, this is, uh, makes me very uncomfortable. So it's a true fact. So spend, spend some years, learn this. <laughs> spend some years, learn that. It's true. <laughs> but this is a statement about finite graphs. There should be a proof using finite graphs. So if the goal was to generate lots of non-trivial classes in the homology of the graph complex, the complete graphs are not the way to do it. So that theorem tells us that that's barking up the wrong tree. So we need to have at least two G edges on a graph of genus G, but maybe let's try to still use this trick that every edge should be contained in a triangle. So I'm going to tell you some, some nice graphs that have the property that every edge is contained in a triangle, and the number of edges is two times the genus. And I think if, if you were to take 10 minutes and think about this, you would write down the same, same list of graphs, I suspect. And if you take 10 minutes and think of a different list of graphs, then let's stop. <laughs> All right, so here's one. So every edge is contained in a triangle, and there are two times as many edges as loops. And so we could start, instead of starting with a triangle, we could start with a square. 
and cut it up into triangles. So every edge is contained in the triangle, and there are twice as many edges as these. And we get an infinite sequence of them, just like we got an infinite sequence of complete graphs. So people call these the wheel graphs. So this is W3, W4, W5, W6, and so on. Automorphism groups of these are, uh, this one is special. The rest of them, the automorphism groups are dihedral. This one is larger, because you can interchange the center vertex with one. Okay, so now let's look at how the dihedral group acts on the edges here. So what if we were to take this square and reflect it along the diagonal? How many pairs of edges would we swap? Three, okay. That is not even, that's odd. So the class of W4 is zero in, in the graph complex. So that's not an interesting one. If we did W6, five pairs of edges if we flip along a diagonal. Okay, so this, so all the even wheels are zero. W5, so the automorphisms of W5 actually do sit inside the alternating group on the 10 edge, uh, on the 10 edges, and you could check that by, by looking at the two generators for the dihedral group. Okay, so now here's another of these theorems that are true, and I do not like the proof. So uh, WG is not in the image of D to G plus 1 for G on. So it's in the kernel of D2G because every edge is contained in a triangle. If you collapse any edge, then you have an odd automorphism. So that passes. And it's not in the image. And so there, there is an infinite sequence of non-trivial classes in the homology of the graph complex. So, uh, so you could set about and, and try to prove this. And the first thing that you would do is you would start checking cases. So we already did g equals 3. And the next thing we would do would be g equals 5. And you could do that by hand. 30 minutes. You do g equals 7. So it gets messy. OK? And so what's happening here? So you look at g equals 5. So you say, well, what could contract to this? Well, there's nothing I can do at the trivalent vertices. Because right? if I tried to expand out a trivalent vertex, I would get a vertex of valence one or two. So the only thing I could do is sort of expand, do the inverse of edge contraction on some edge that would collapse to this pi valent vertex. And you'd look at the different ways that you could do that. And you're going to split off a two and a three. And you, so then you would have five choose two pairs of things you could split off, and many of them are going to be the same as each other. So you really only have a few different types of graphs that could be mapping down to this, and some of them have odd automorphisms, and so you get to throw those away. So you actually only have a couple of things that are contracting down to this, and they contract down to this, but they also contract down to some other stuff. And then you have to look at everything else that could contract down to that other stuff. And you start building a zigzag. And when you do it for g equals 5, it ends after about three steps. And then you can just see that, ah, there's nothing here that can get only the 5 wheel. Whenever the 5 wheel is one of the terms in the image under d, then there are other terms as well. Try to do that for g equals 7, and that zigzag keeps going for quite a while. You're not going to do this by hand, but you could do this by computer. And you'll, you'll need 15, 20 megabytes of memory and, and to keep track of all of the graphs that show up as you zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. You get a really big matrix, and you check off. Yeah, you, you just you can't get W7. 
You can try to do the same thing for g equals 9, and your computer will run and run and run and run. And you'll, you'll use up lots and lots and lots of electricity, and you'll never, ever get the an answer. And there's no, to my eye, there's no discernible pattern in what shows up. On the other hand, this is a theorem, and so there's a proof. So let me sketch for you what goes into the proof. So given a graph, there is a way of associating a number. So it's A of G, and this is a real number. And this number is called the Feynman amplitude. So this is the so this is the contribution of this uh, graph to some particle interactions in three-dimensional churn Simon speed. So this is a perturbative topological quantum field. So what you're supposed to think is that there's some model of, of particle interactions in which graphs show up. And every possible interaction occurs, and each more and more complicated graph gives a smaller and smaller perturbation to the probability of some global interaction uh, coming up. And so, so this, so each graph gives some real number, which is the contribution to some probability of some interaction. That's the final. And if you, so these are expressed as an integral, which after some renormalization converges. So this is an integral on some non-compact open set in some Euclidean space. And then if you look at the shape of this integral, the way it's written down in terms of the graph, you will see that it has the following property. So, so the integral depends on the orientation. And if the some linear combination of oriented graphs is in the image of D, then the corresponding sum of Feynman amplitudes is here. So this is some identity. This is the this is an easy part to check. So given given the integral, you can check that it, it has this property. Okay, and now you're going to write down the integral that gives the Feynman amplitude of the G wheel when G is off. Okay, so, so you have one piece of input from mathematical physics. And then the next piece of input is from analytic number theory. So you use analytic number theory to show that the amplitude of WG is a non-zero rational multiple of the Riemann zeta function <laughs> evaluated at G. So this is the sum of the reciprocals of the G powers of the positive integers. So in particular, this is not zero, this is not zero. The Feynman amplitude is not zero, and so WG is not in the image of T. This proof makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> I really hope that someone will find a better proof that sheds light on this phenomenon in a way that will allow us to make further progress towards understanding the homology of the graph. So I, I, I say that this proof makes me uncomfortable, and it's true. I also find this proof exciting. So, so what, what this is pointing at is some sort of you know, we, we say this, and it's sort of trite and cliche, but there is some unity in mathematics. So all these different pieces of mathematics, mathematical physics, analytic number theory, topology, algebraic geometry, when we get into our one research project, 
our view tends to narrow and we really zoom in on one little piece of mathematics and we go deep. And that's great. That's, that's part of doing research. And yet, there is this zoomed out perspective from which all of these different techniques, all of these different points of view are, are different angles on one mathematical reality. And sometimes they all come together in, in strange and surprising ways that, that tell us that we should spend years uh, learning, learning more mathematics. So there, there are, uh, so there are reasons for wanting to understand the homology of the graph complex that are not so easy to explain. But this is an object that, that shows up in many different contexts. So let me uh, try to uh, hint at some more of the structure that's here in this graph complex. And, and this will this will be only a sort of a little bit of a hint, and then, then we'll come back to Earth, and, and I'll, I'll give you something more more concrete to, to think about. Whenever you see some sort of homology theory showing up, there will be some dual theory, so cohomology, and uh, under most circumstances, you could just take cohomology to be the dual vector space of homology. So let's do that. So we can take the direct sum of all of these graph complexes. So that's something that's computing homology, and we could take its dual. And so now this is some infinite dimensional vector space. So when you take the dual of a direct sum, you don't get the direct sum of the duals, you get the product of the duals. So this is the product over G of, uh, of what do I want to say? All right, so let me just start from here. So this has some extra structure, so it's a differential uh, graded Lie algebra. So the differential is, so D goes in the other direction, so because of duality, so instead of edge contractions, you take a linear combination assigns sum of edge uncontractions. So you take every vertex that has valence greater than three, and you expand in an edge in every possible way. And then you keep track of signs very carefully. So that's the differential, which now increases the number of edges, but still preserves the genes. And it's graded by the number of edges. And now it has some additional structure, which is that there's a Lie algebra. So there's an additional uh, pairing, uh, which so it takes so there's a bracket of g omega and g prime omega prime, and so what does this do? So this is going to be additive on g and additive on the number of edges, and so it takes a graph. So let's say here's one graph, and here's another graph. And what it does is it takes each vertex of this graph and splits it into as many vertices as needed. So we have these edges dangling. And now we have these three dangling edges. And we connect each of them to a vertex of the alpha graph in every possible way. And we do that for every vertex of this graph. And we do that for every vertex of this graph, splitting the vertex apart and attaching it onto this graph. And we keep track of signs. So, so we take that sum with some signs that keep track of which vertex and which orientation. And then we check that that satisfies the Jacobi identity and then G omega paired with G omega is zero. And so that makes this a Lie algebra. And then we check that the Lie algebra structure is compatible with this differential of uh, uncontraction. It's not so hard. It's, it's combinatorial. It's, it's a page or two of verification. And this implies that 
we get a linear algebra structure on the product over G and I of HI KG. And so what this means is that we can take, so if we have a graph homology class that's non-trivial, then we know that the dual group is non-trivial, so we can choose some element of, of the dual vector space. And then we can take those and start bracketing them together with each other to construct new elements for higher G and higher numbers of edges. And if that's non-zero, then the corresponding graph homology group had to be non-zero because if the dual is non-zero, then, then the group is non-zero. So let me, uh, so for instance, so since W3 is not zero, there is some element of H6K3 dual that is non-zero. So we'll call that sigma three. And because W5 is not zero, there is some element sigma 5 in the dual that pairs non trivially with W5, and so on for 7, 9, 1, and, and so on. Oh gosh, okay. Uh, and so, so here's a theorem. So there exists a sigma G in uh, H2G AG. For G on uh, at least G, uh, such that, so first of all, so because it's in the dual vector space, we compare it with the class of WG. This is not zero. So, sigma G is the thing that witnesses the fact that WG is not in the image of D. And two, sigma 3, sigma 5, sigma 7. Sigma 9, and so on. So if I take the bracket of sigma 3 with sigma 5, I end up with g is equal to 8, and the number of edges adds up too. So it's 16 edges. So, um, so these, and then you can ask, is that 0 or not 0 in h16 of k8? And in fact, it's not 0. And sigma 3 bracketed with sigma 7 is not 0 in H20 of K10. And sigma 3 bracketed with sigma 5 bracketed with sigma 7 is not 0 in H30 of K15. Okay? So that means in H30 of K15, we have two different classes. We have W15, and we have sigma 3 bracketed with the bracket of sigma 5 and sigma 7. The fact is that those are linearly independent. So that group has dimension at least two. So the fact here is that these generate a free Leo, free Lee subalgebra of, of this Leo. So that means, as a consequence, so the dimension of H2G KG is bigger than 1.2 G plus some constant. So, so these groups are actually really big. And this is coming from the real root of t cubed minus t minus one. So anything less than the real root of t cubed minus t minus one, you could put there some particular one point two two is okay. And then there's the conjecture of Delane and Grinfeld. And this is again, this is a statement about finite graphs. And the conjecture is that uh, the product over G, H, 2G, KG, dual, is the free Lie algebra on these generators. There's nothing else. So this is a conjecture that's been around now for, for a while. Uh, it, It carries an action of the Galois group of Q bar over Q, and that action is faithful. And so answering this question would give us new information about the, about the absolute Galois group. 
So that's that's why these people who really need health care. And this is a question that, in principle, one could one could disprove this in a half page of computations with finite graphs if it's false. You just write down some graph homology class that is non-zero and pairs trivially with sigma three, sigma five, sigma seven, whatever, whatever you can build up. So that's an open problem. <laughs> uh, and that open problem is probably hard. So uh, let me end with an open problem that's not so bad. Okay, so, so here's another example of non-trivial graph homology. So the smallest number of edges you could have to have non-trivial graph homology is 2G. Right? So that was one of the theorems we wrote down. It vanishes for fewer than 2G. The most, the highest number of edges is 3G minus 3. Okay, so we gave one example. And so when you have 3G minus 3 edges, you're not in the image of D because there's nothing you can uncontract. So now we're just looking for things that are in the kernel that have 3G minus 3 edges. So one example is K4 for genus 3. So fact, there are, there's nothing non-trivial in the kernel for g equals 4 with 9 edges. There's nothing non-trivial in the kernel for g equals 5 with 12 edges. But the kernel for g equals 6 with 15 edges is one-dimensional. And it's spanned by a linear combination of these five graphs, each with 15 edges and 10 vertices. Now, there, does anyone here have a favorite graph with 15 edges and 10 vertices? Peterson, yeah. The Peterson is not one of those. <laughs> so, this is the first example I know of of a list of special graphs with 15 vertices and 10 edges that does not include the Peterson. <laughs> but so here it is in 2, 3, 6, 3, 4. So those are the coefficients. And of course, we have to put orientations on them. So exercise, choose the orientations on those five graphs such that with those coefficients, d is equal to 0. Okay, so now the open problem uh, other examples of non zero elements of the kernel of D for 3T minus 3 edges on occasion. So I don't know any other examples. So there's K4, and there's this one. Is there another example? Are there infinitely many more examples? Does the dimension of H3G minus 3KG go to infinity as G goes to infinity? I would guess yes, and yet I don't know how to write down even one more example. So I know there are no more examples for G equals 6, but I don't know the answer for G equals 7. So there's a challenge problem. So so write down linear combinations of graphs, genus 7, 18 edges, 12 vertices, such that d is equal to 0. So there's a problem for us if you can teach. I'll stop there. Anyone want to ask a question? Yeah. Z mod 2z coefficients, then, then signs would behave very badly. So just knowing that g was equal to minus g wouldn't tell you that g was equal to zero. So you would get very different dimensions. Uh, I think the dimension should probably work out OK if you don't do uh, characteristic 2. Uh, but in the background, there is actually a space of graphs. Uh, with edge length. So edge contraction is going to the face of some simplex. So you have some simplex 
that parameterizes all the possible edge lengths that add up to one on a given graph. And edge contraction is passing to the boundary of that simplex. And so this is computing simplicial homology of some space of graphs compactly supported. The automorphisms of those graphs uh, are causing trouble. So, so this is a space that's not glued out of simplices like a simplicial complex. It's glued out of quotients of simplices by finite groups in the automorphism groups of the graph. And because of those finite group actions, if you were to, so with rational coefficients, this graph complex is computing the rational compactly supported homology of that space. If we took um, integer coefficients or finite field coefficients, we would not get, we would get something else. And, and so that's the reason. So the rational coefficients is sort of the most meaningful uh, incarnation of this. That, that's exactly what the graded means. And, and this is actually a bi-graded. So it's graded by the genus, and it's graded by the number of edges. So when you take the bracket of two classes, the, gen the, the genera add, and the number of edges add. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Oh, so I have kind of an open-ended question. Uh, so Lavasse in the 1970s used kind of a different sort of complex construction. So to a graph he associated a simplicial com complex, or the vertices of the simplicial complex or the vertices of the graph. And he showed that um, the connectivity of the simplicial complex in a topological sense gives a lower bound on the chromatic number of the graph. And I'm wondering, do you know, like, do, do his results or methods have any results here? Not that I know of. No. So the, the simplices that show up in the space of graphs uh, have vertices corresponding to the edges. There, I should say that there are sort of many, many variations on this construction. So you can make a complex of, of ribbon graphs, uh, where you put some additional structure, where you in uh, a cyclic ordering of the half edges and submit to each vertex. Um, you could choose different sign conventions. So we said that you know, g omega is sine of sigma times g prime omega prime, where sigma is the induced permutation on the set of edges. But you could take the induced permutation on the set of half edges, or the union of the vertices and the edges. So, and each of these would give you a different graph complex. This one is called the even commutative graph complex. Uh, so it's possible that there's some graph complex that's related to chromatic numbers. But I don't know which one. So, so there's sort of a graph complex associated to each operat, which is some uh, algebraic uh, construction. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, so you said that um, you think this will be studied a lot more in the future. Why do you think so many people will, will focus on that? In this, in this This complex uh, knows a lot about a lot of different objects in mathematics. So homology of one graph complex encodes uh, vacilli of invariance of knots, so low-dimensional topology. Uh, there's another graph complex that encodes the good little calculus, which is, tells us about the homotopy groups of the space of diffeomorphic embeddings of Rm into Rn. So higher dimensional topology. Uh, this particular graph complex, I've been studying it because it encodes one graded piece of the weight filtration on the cohomology of the moduli space of curves. So these graph complexes, they know, it's, it's almost sort of disturbing how much information they have, given how elementary they are. And, and as I mentioned, they. You know, uh, you know, one piece of the homology of this graph complex is a faithful representation of the absolute algorithm. So, and there's, uh, so there's, there's a deep number theory showing up. So for instance, the 
relations in, in graph homology are also encoding um, Q relations of special values of the Riemann zeta function and related functions such as poly logarithms and multiple, well, multiple zeta functions. And so those are sort of hard number theory questions. So people are going to keep studying these graph complexes because they have information that we care about and people are making progress. So we know a lot more about the graph complex now than we did 10 years ago. So, we, so if we were stuck and this, you know, if this had tons of information but we couldn't do anything with it, then I wouldn't be so optimistic that there would be a lot of activity. But because we're making progress and it has deep information, I'm quite confident that people will work hard on this side. Uh, going to be dinner, seventh floor math tower next door. <laughs> <laughs>